Video 29, Panama, Part 2 Chapter 4, Left Alone It was at precisely this moment that the first man left the room. He had been sitting to the left of us, just across on the other side of the entrance, to the strangely white, clean, and sort of celestial-looking passageway. The officer glanced at me as he passed. It was a sad and very feminine glance, and he shook his head as if thinking, what a waste. Why would they harm me? I told you that I couldn't identify them. Then a second detective left. His face was turned away from me, as if he wanted one day to be able to pass a lie detector test while claiming he could not tell for certain whether I had been in the room or not, as he left it. That is true. You never said anything, Senor Laszlo, and I know that. However, they do not, nor do I think they will believe you when you tell them, if they give you time enough to do so. They will just think you are saying that in order that they shall not kill you. They will think so because they know that most of the time we are told what we want to be told. As one detective after the other left the room, as I kept asking my interviewing officer why the shot man's friend would want to harm me, as my interviewing officer kept ignoring my questions, as the room started to feel strangely cold and deserted, as even the smoke started to thin out, my feeling of impending doom grew ever more overwhelming. But don't you worry. If you get harmed in any way, we shall punish the perpetrators. I felt distinctly unwell as I looked at the little man who apparently had just expressed his intention to severely harm me. If you had chosen to identify them, then we could have protected you. We could have solved this little problem before it got out of hand. But I am afraid that is too late now. There were just six people left in the room when I finally realized what I had to do. I gathered my courage, stood up, and turned around so as to address the remaining detectives. Hey, you guys, what's happening here? Why are you all leaving like this? Are you all going? Are you gonna leave me alone here? Is this man going to... to harm me? There was no answer, only a shaken head a pitiful look or two and maybe an amused a smile, though less so than before. It was still smoky, and I couldn't say for certain. I knew that this was wrong, the way I was treated, yet somehow it felt as if they were right, and I could emphasize, even feel a certain degree of sympathy with their way of going about things. In a strange way, I was on their side. Again, read the trial and you will understand. And for the first time, I started to believe that I was about to die. I would no longer have offered to double the money to somebody wanting to bet that I'd be alive or dead rather within 12 hours. As my interviewing officer pulled the papers out of the typewriter, checked them, and placed them in front of me with a sign there, there and there, please. There were only two other officers left in the room, both young and emotionless. One looked intelligent, in the computer-clever, nerdy sort of way. The other, stupid and not fully developed. They made me think of Steinbeck's Mice and Men, they seemed to have no intention of leaving. My executioners, I thought. I scribbled down my signature, getting a copy but not really checking what I had signed, but assuming it 
for later to be discovered insufficiently good reasons to be the truth. Senor Laszlo, I think we are done. Thank you for your cooperation. I hope you will enjoy the rest of your stay here in Panama. Chapter 5 The Passageway I felt like throwing myself onto the floor in subjugation, like telling the officer that I was ready to do whatever he saw fit as long as he just allowed me to live that I was willing to and ready to humiliate myself in any imaginable way, to plea for mercy, anything. I never actually considered offering to kill the wounded man for them, but had I been asked to, I probably would have been prepared to do that too. Anything rather than the death that I now felt more or less certain awaited me. My interviewers left despite my voriferous protest, leaving me alone with the two young men. The clever-looking one nodded me in the direction of the strangely white and well-lit corridor. The mouse man was cleaning his nails. Both their holsters were undone. I must have walked through that corridor a hundred times in my thoughts and dreams since then. And the truth probably is that my report of what I experienced inside of it could well be pretty distorted. However, as I remember once having remembered it, or rather, more likely, how I remember once having remembered remembering it, or worse, as I started to walk towards the bright light one part of me still believed there was a chance, only a slim chance, but yet a chance, that I would be allowed to leave the station alive. Why shouldn't they let me go? I am no threat to them, am I? And I have done nothing wrong. Another part, however, was convinced that I was about to be shot from behind. I sound like Lady Macduff, and look what happened to her. The corridor was newly painted, and I noted that whoever had done it had made an excellent job of it. Why would they kill me? It definitely could not have been the same people who had painted the office. What are they afraid of? What could I possibly do to harm them if they just allowed me to go? The lights inside the corridor were bright, the lamps clean, and it seemed that there was not a single dead insect inside the globes. Why, why, why? How on earth could there be no dead insects into the globes? Would they really kill me just for the fun of it? It was as if one team of cleaners were responsible for the passageway and another team for the office. At least I could find no other explanation to account for the difference. And if I was right, the corridor cleaning team must have left only just before I arrived. Why would they use two different cleaning teams? As I turned around to see whether the youngsters were making ready to dispose of my mother's favorite son, only son, actually. Uh, I could see virtually nothing. But then it should smell of detergents. It doesn't. It smells of, of nothing. I still could not make out the youngsters. Yet somewhere inside the starkly contrasting twilight of the office, I knew that they were looking at me. Do they use this corridor to shoot people? Is that why it's so bright and white in here? so you shall not see them, or so that they shall see you better. I knew that they could see me, as if I had been a highlighted target on a pistol range. Of course. And that is why it's kept so clean. They wash away all the blood. This is an execution chamber. I should have figured that out. The passageway was maybe six meter long, 
And as I approached the meadow, my legs started wobbling, giving notice that they might not be okay with carrying me the remaining four or so meters to the door. I didn't play ball. That's where I went wrong. These are all ex noriega drug traffickers and killing people is what they have done throughout their lives. Of course they will kill me, even if just for the fun of it. I assume they wanted me as close to the door as possible before they shot me. Lazy buggers. That way they would have to drag me for a little shorter. They would probably weigh in me in afterwards and claim some price. As I arrived at the middle of the passageway, I, suddenly and surreally looking at myself as from outside, realized that even if I in some miraculous way managed to escape the death, the Andre Laszlo that exited this police station, especially this passageway, would not be the same Andre Laszlo as the one who entered it. Why would they undo their holsters unless they intended to use their guns? As I reached out to take another somewhat dwarfed and shaky step, I once more looked over my shoulder. Again, there was nothing more than a murky twilight, where I knew the officers could very well be aiming their weapons at me. I could discern nothing and nobody. Why would all the others have left unless I was about to be killed? Then I recalled that people shot in the back were considered cowards, so in order not to bring dishonor onto my relatives and friends, I turned around so as to take the bullets from the proper direction, thus taking my last and desperately hesitant states steps towards the end of the hallway backwards. They will probably bury me in one of those Noriega's mass graves I've read about. I reached for the door behind me, and I pushed it open. Did they only play games with me? Did they just have a bit of fun? There were no bullet holes in the door, or in the walls. Is it all over? How stupid I am! Of course there would have been bullet holes. Then I was outside. Of course, how could I be such an idiot? Chapter 6 Panama by Night Get in! It was the two youngsters, now in a small flatbed pickup truck, and they were right behind me. One, the mouse man, was standing on the back of the truck, while the other, the driver, who was instructing me to get in, was holding up the passenger door from inside, waiting for me to enter. There was only room for two in the front of the car. Get in, I said. Sure, again I was frightened, but this time in a more logical way than before, in a less emotional way. My brain was sort of back on line, and at least now it felt as if it was on my side. In a funny sort of way, I had already died. So now it felt there was no longer any real reason to be worried about that particular aspect of existence. I could think straight again. Why? We'll drive you to your hotel. No thanks, I'll walk. This is a dangerous neighborhood. You could easily get attacked. Nah, no risk. I'm a big guy. Big and strong. I will survive. The driver put his hand onto his gun. I am an honest man, and I have never lied, not even to my mother, so you can take my word for it. You would not. All right, but I'm too big to fit in there, I said, nodding at the passenger seat, and then, swiftly and without a word, I jumped up onto the back of the truck. The honest driver who had never lied not even to his mother, protested loudly from inside. The man already on the back of the truck, the mouse man, must have figured that I was about to attack him, 
because after some fumbling he managed to pull out his gun, putting it back into his holster, only when repeatedly and insistently instructed to do so by the honest man. The mouse man then tried to wrestle me down off the truck, which was not at all a very clever idea, and as I lifted him up and carefully lowered him onto the street, holding on to his ankle with both my hands, I continued to argue my somewhat insane claim that I was too big to fit in the front and that I therefore had to remain on the back of the truck. It was, of course, an absolutely ludicrous thing to say. Though big, very big even, I was not that big. But it was ludicrous in the same sort of manner as they being in the right and their offer to drive me to the hotel were ludicrous. It was as if Kafka suddenly had decided to swap side and to give me a break. Because somehow it did not sound as stupid as it ought to have sounded. At that moment a pretty girl on high heels wearing a lot of makeup came walking along across from where we were towards where we were having our argument. The man whom I had lowered off the truck had stood up and was now impatiently waving at her to hurry past, obviously wanting no witnesses to what he figured was about to happen. Hola Linda! I shouted. Hello, pretty. The girl turned around to give me a pleasant smile. Today I am sorry and ashamed that I risked her well-being, and she started to walk towards us. The man just lowered, low, lowered to the ground, quite violently intercepted the girl and pushed her away in the direction she had been heading. Tu no ha visto nada. You have seen nothing. They obviously did not like what had just happened. The girl seeing me and hearing me talk in an accent, revealing me to be of foreign origin. Linda, espera! Soy Andres Laszlo, I shouted. Pretty one, wait, I am Andre Laszlo. I called after the disappearing girl, thus probably nearly getting the girl killed and gaining no bonus points for gallantry whatsoever. Espera! As the girl stopped to turn around, the man on the ground, taking the driver's cue, jumped up into the passenger seat originally designated for me, and off we were. Dear girl, if you ever listen to this, thank you. Your presence allowed me to stay on the back of the truck, and in addition it gave me an insight in my would-be executors thinking that probably later saved my life. I have never so far been a customer of the trade that I believe you represent, but if we ever meet again, give me a kiss and tell me you forgive me, and I'll happily give you the thousand dollars. <coughs> We drove through what seemed to be central parts of Panama City, and as we did, there were lots of people out and about, some of them spotting and pointing at the big man on the back of the truck. That seemed to make the men inside it ill at ease, something that in turn reflected itself in the driving. The honest man, the one who never lied, drove like a madman, and I had to hold on for dear life. I figured they probably drove like that, either in order to keep me from attempting to draw attention to myself, or from jumping off. Whatever their reason, when we came into the suburbs, we nearly, we never even got close to my hotel, by the way, the honest man slowed down to a more sensible pace. That, however, was of no use to me, because had I jumped off now, I would have been easily caught, or at least easily shot, and with no or few witnesses. But now there was not, by now there was not the slightest doubt in my mind. 
I was on my way to an untimely death and probably a densely populated, foul-smelling and rather shallow grave. I was contemplating throwing myself off the truck anyhow, berating myself for not having done so earlier when there were lots of people around, thus moronically giving up my one hard-earned advantage, but I decided against it. I then considered trying to bribe these guys, they seemed pretty bribable, but since they of course would uh, take my wallet and credit card after they had killed me, that did not seem much of a lifesaver either. Why didn't somebody take my wallet before I left? I mean, I could have thrown it away. I still could, can, I mean can. So instead I assessed my chances of taking out about my would-be killers and then escape. First I considered the, the possibility sort of only in jest or half in jest, not really reflecting over what taking out really meant. But then, as I continued thinking through the different possible scenarios, I became more serious. Why not? Whenever the impossible has been eliminated. I mean, I am stronger than them put together. I know a little about these things. And the mouse man was so scared that he fumbled with his gun just to see me jump onto the truck. So if I first take out the honest man, maybe that actually could work. Maybe I could drive the truck back to the canal and bribe my way onto a ship. Actually, that soon started to sound like quite a reasonable idea. Kill the buggers and get onto a boat. Chapter 7. Alabi Alaba. Suddenly there was chaos. Cars were hooting, including the one I was riding on. People were shouting. Yet most of it seemed to be done in a spirit of semi-drunken merriment. It was an enthusiastic bunch of revelers that surrounded us. Without any actual proof, I assumed them to be football fans. They seemed to be returning from a victorious, or at least a very enjoyable, game. There must have been at least a hundred of them. In front of us, a big dirty truck had been brought to a halt, and though I could not see past it, it definitely kept us from moving forward. Behind us, several cars had stopped, keeping us from returning the way we had come. They too were hooting their horns. Hola, gigante! Toma! Hello, big man! Catch! Somebody shouted and threw me a strangely cold beer bottle. That is when I got my brainwave. And your speaker, your video maker, all 130 kilos of me, stood up and cleared his throat in order to do the one thing I always intuitively had known that I was not sent to earth to do. I sang, and the text of the short but rather catchy song I sang was Alabi, Alaba, Alabim, Bumba, Real, Real, Inadie, Mas. Since the people swarming around the cars were mainly Hispanic and presumably football fans, I figured there would be a reasonable chance they would remember a double-sized man standing up on the back of a truck shouting Real Madrid's football club's fan song, even if most of them seemed to have had a drink, or even two, too many. Arabi, Araba, Arabim, Bumba, Real, Real, you know, you must. It seemed my assumption had been correct. Because in corroboration, people did indeed stop to take in the unusual spectacle. Arabi, Araba, Arabim, Bumba. Esta loco, somebody observed. He's crazy. Arabi, Araba, Arabim, Bumba. Que grande, somebody else said. 
is so big. Alabi, alaba. Es un extranjero. Another one said, that's a foreigner. Su canto es terrible, observed the fort. He does not sing all that well. Arabi, Araba, Arabim Bumba. Es un matador, exclaimed the fifth, pointing at the man in the passenger seat. That's a hitman. During all this, the driver had kept honking his horn, frenetically, signaling the crowd to disperse and the car in front to move, all while his partner flashed what I assumed was a police ID. The crowd had kept surrounding us, and for what I remember, as at least an additional three minutes. It was in all enough time for me to shout myself hoarse. I continued to treat the crowd to what must have been some rather unusual post-match entertainment. They had witnessed the spectacle of how this giant of a man, obviously a foreigner, from the back of what had been identified as a police truck containing at least one hitman, while drinking a cold beer, in a voice that had uh, somewhat failed to impress them, had sung the Real Madrid theme song. Recuerdame, recuerdame, van a matarme, van a matarme, avisa la embajada americana, I added, maybe half a dozen times. Remember me, they're gonna kill me, informed the American embassy. As the truck ahead of us eventually got moving, it spitted out so much black, oily, absolutely disgusting and probably highly toxic exhaust towards me that it nearly completed my executioner's mission for them. However, Lady Luck was smiling at me this night, and I survived that too. And as we drove off, I knew with virtual certainty that a fair part of the crowd had understood the significance of what, what I had alleged was happening, that several had believed me, and that at least one of them, in all likelihood, would, would do what I had asked for and contact the American embassy, once they had sobered up. And even if nobody did, the police could not know that. As we drove off, several revelers had thrown things after us, mainly empty bottles and cans. While doing the throwing, some had shouted Real or Madrid. Those were the ones who had thrown things at the drivers. Others had shouted Barça or Barcelona, those were the one who had, often with an uncanny precision, aimed at me. I felt pretty certain that my executioners, at least the honest one, had understood the significance of what had just transpired, and I no longer would have given double the money against me being alive in twelve hours not even 1.1. I figured I was pretty safe now, and that nothing would be gained by jumping off the truck. On the contrary, if I had jumped off now, the mouse man might well have panicked and shot me. Once at a safe distance from the revelers, the honest man uh, indeed stopped the car in order to talk to somebody over the radio. I could hear a few words of the conversation, but as I write this or speak this uh, down nearly two decades later, I no longer remember what they were, other than that it was about what had just happened. Uh, it was between 11 and midnight when they let me off outside my hotel, and as they were about to leave, the honest driver asked me please to return my copy of the police report. I was prepared for that, and I lied, saying that I had thrown it into the crowd of football fans. It seemed he believed me, and as he drove off, he gave me a smile, 
and I think he even raised his eyebrows, sort of saluting. There was a pleasant light in his eyes, indicating that something interesting at least had the potential of going on behind them, and for a moment I felt happy that life had not put me in a situation where my only means of survival would have been to put that light out. This is the story as I remember it. But how does all this relate to how the drug racket's member corrupt by conduction like bumping into others? Chapter 8. What did conduction do? When many years later I reflected over the different participants in this tale of what I think of as conduction, and a drug-related death. If a death it was, these are my thoughts as I tried to relate what took place to the issue of conducting or conduction by asking, one, where the, whether the morality issue, the good-bad stuff that transpired could be categorized under the heading of conduction, and two, whether if so, good had been turned into bad, or bad into good. Looking at the people involved, let's first agree to forget about the police officer at the first location, the first station. He seemed a good guy and he probably wasn't all that altered by this interaction, i.e. with me and Sean the shooter. The same can probably be said about the re revelers, because although my singing has been accused of a lot of things, turning people's moral around has so far not been one of them. As to the rest, Victor the victim, Sean the shooter, my two interviewers and my two executioners, these were all bad guys to start with and possibly with the exception of Sean, and if so very marginally, I do not think that I did anything to turn bad into good. Their interaction with me did nothing to turn bad into good. However, their interaction with me all confirmed their badness to themselves. Mm. One even died or got shot. So, as to the bad guys, nothing good happened to them because of their interaction with me. I, that sort of stands for goodness in this case, didn't impart anything of that. But, unfortunately, the story doesn't end there, because there is another individual yet to be taken into account. And that's me. Yes, dear listener, I too am part of this equation. I was not as white as snow when I was led into that second police station, nor was I as black as sin when it all was over. Yet, as I jumped down from the back of the truck in front of my hotel, I was not the same man as I had been when I felt those hands entering my pockets from behind. During the four hours or so that I spent in the company of Panamanian law enforcement, first with Victor the victim and the detective, then with my interviewers, and finally with my should-have-been executioners, I did a lot of things I had never done before, and in doing those new things, I changed as a human being. I had for a moment taken great joy in that somebody I believed had tried to rob me got his comeuppance, got shot even, and I had indeed rushed towards the injured man with the intention of detaining and maybe even using some force. I had been prepared to sign a false statement, and as I eventually 
20 years or so later got around to take a closer look at what I had signed, it turned out that I indeed had done precisely that. I had been so scared that I would have agreed to do more or less anything in order to save my life. I had risked the well-being of the pretty girl who had happened to walk past as I was arguing my right to remain on the back of the truck. I had sung in public. I had decided to kill, or at least to attempt to kill, my two executioners, and though I did not get around to attempt it, I had dealt with a mental preparation. I had taken the decision to attempt to deprive two fellow human beings of their lives. And as you, I hope, have never been forced into taking such a decision, let me assure you that taking it altered the nature of one's being. It changes one because, just as deciding to resort to drugs, crimes, corruption, religion, counselling or wine to solve a problem once, the taking of such a decision increases the probability that one will try to use the same solution again. A person who does all this contemplates to inflict unnecessarily harm to one who is possibly guiltless, is willing to do whatever it takes to survive, risk harm coming to the way of an innocent bystander by involving her in a crime against oneself, sing in public with a voice like mine, decide to attempt to kill two fellow human beings, and act deceptively, becomes a lesser person than he or she was before this experience, closer to bed. Even though I can see that on some occasions I could not have acted more honourably or correctly, at least not while hanging on to my life, I feel that a drug racket that follows from drug illegality and supply-oriented drug policies, albeit with my willing and sometimes even enthusiastic cooperation by means of what I call conduction, and thus indirectly drug illegality, has turned me into a lesser human being. And with that, I end this video series. Thank you for watching.